Hey everyone, how are you doing? Welcome to part 8 of Let's Consider Luke. And I personally just wish from the bottom of my heart that there didn't have to be so many parts to this. I mean, um, I do kind of wish that there could have been maybe, maybe three or four points to Luke that just could have been highlighted and then on to the next thing. I really actually thought that the uh, the general basic notes that I took would be sufficient and how wrong I was. Uh, now before I get started, it's 5.16 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, September 8th, 2021 years from something. Who knows what? So today I pick up in Luke 15. And um, I actually, I'm not releasing this video w with such delay from the last video for any other reason than because of the extreme departures that we will see in the next couple of chapters from anything else that is available in the Bible in the 66 books of the accepted canon of the Bible. And, uh, my goodness, we could probably just throw in there the Apocrypha or, or anything else. And Dead Sea Scroll finds, you, you just pile it all in, and it's still in, um, it, it's still standing apart from about anything else that anyone could even attempt to argue with Scripture. So what happened was, as I looked at chapter 15 forward, specifically the next few chapters, the departure was so great, the amount of material that was standalone in just Luke was so intensive. Oh my goodness, I... At first, I thought, well, I, you know, I need to actually, I need to take extensive notes on all of this. And then when I started going verse by verse through what was there, I just decided, you know, this is, this is far too much. This is, this is so much, it's insane. So look, Luke 15, we'll start in Luke 15. And I'm going to point out the first problem, okay? If we're going by, remember, we, I, and i got to keep reinforcing this because it illustrates how big a problem Luke is. Remember, if you didn't have the four Gospels, which people use, they use those four Gospels. And the way they do it is they mix and match material that they find in these different Gospels, if they want to prove a certain point, and it's not provable in the other Gospels, like for instance, uh, CI tries to, they, they heavily rely on the account of John to prove their point that the, the Jews that we know today were the Wudeos and Wudeon, as opposed to the Judahites, which would be the consistent application of that term, that Koine Greek transliteration throughout these Gospels. That would be the consistent making sense of it application, but that doesn't work in their dogma. So they have to extensively quote from John. But if you only had these Gospels as individual Gospels, and say just one individual Gospel was available to a certain group of people for a certain extended period of time, they would get a very, very different understanding of what they believed was the life of, the deeds of, the words of Jesus um, than somebody who had another one. And, you know, even though I refer to Matthew as my control, uh, and I do oftentimes say that that Mark 
on its surface, what it does is it looks like a truncation of Matthew because it it sort of is. It, it follows much closer to Matthew in chronology, but a lot of it is, is far more truncated than Matthew. Like the Mark doesn't have the Sermon on the Mount per se like Matthew does, things like that, okay? Or, or the Olivet Dif Discourse. So Luke isn't truncated like that, but Luke has a, 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 a large amount of material that you're not going to find anywhere else. And uh, the author of Luke is certainly pushing ideas that not only will you not find anywhere else, uh, but as I illustrated last time with the, the, um, the situation with the Samaritan, the Good Samaritan, and the Samaritans... Uh, come up over and over again in Luke, he puts them more on a pedestal, whereas we can see that the Jesus of Matthew um, has the complete opposite opinion of the Samaritan. So there's that heavy contrast. Now, okay, so when we start in Luke 15, 7, the first contrast we're going to see is in context and setting. Um, so Luke 15, 1 through 7 is, it's out of context with Matthew 18, 1 through 14, which is supposed to be the parallel to this, okay? In, in Matthew, you show Jesus. His disciples are asking, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's the context for what he says after that, okay? In Luke, uh, 15, 1 through 7, it's in response concerning what the scribes and Pharisees' criticism are of him in keeping company with sinners. Now, that is, that is a stark contrast, uh, and, and it, is, it is absolutely entirely different. If somebody wants to get an idea of why anyone is saying something, what you always have to do is try to establish the context. Because I can say something, I can make any statement or ask any question in different contexts. And the, uh, the impact of maybe what I'm stating or asking can be vastly different depending on, of course, that different context. Uh, different things somebody might say or ask of me or... Uh, really just different environments I, I may be in, or a different situation, because these are entirely different situations, which should bring a lot of uh, questions in our mind. Why are even these parallel passages that we find, they, they're saying exactly the same thing. There are passages or verses in Luke that are saying exactly the same thing in wording as what we can find in Matthew. However, the context is entirely different. And that alone is enough, or should be enough, for us to say, all right, there is a real problem here. It's not a little problem. It's not something we can just shrug off or sweep under the rug. This is a very serious problem we're looking at. All right? Now, so what we have is, in, in Luke 15, 1 through 7, is um, we have an idea that it's nearly the same in Luke as what it is in Matthew. It is about a lost sheep and uh, somebody going and finding their lost sheep and, and rejoicing over that lost sheep, okay? And it's a very different concept in Matthew. And Luke, and actually, uh, I think when I went to Matthew to, uh, to contrast it, I think what happened was the first time I did this, I, I spent a long time actually thinking about the, con <laughs> the context that this was in and got a little bit frustrated because it takes a considerable amount of time in Matthew 18 
to figure out why he's going from one subject to the other based on that context uh, and I'm not going to I'm not going to stay with that this is something that I may be able to uh, address in the future but that's one of the reasons that I got hung up and didn't produce this is just because that may mean that there was some problems in the text that's one thing the other thing is it may mean I'm just not understanding the train of thought if there's a subject if there's material that somebody is you know they're speaking they're teaching they're saying something important and um, and somebody records those things and it goes from one thing to the other in this certain train of thought and you don't understand it now that could mean as I just said that there were problems as far as the way that the text was transmitted to us but it also mean that there was problems with the way that the person reading it is understanding it either which way those two are radically out of context and situation also the three verses that follow interestingly enough in Luke those three verses they actually do follow a logical train of thought as far as their context Luke uh, 15 8 through 10 because he's going into this uh, I guess they call it the parable of the lost coin a woman who lost a coin she finds her coin um, th this also incorporates this verse likewise I say unto you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents um now let's see um because some of these things as i said i am going to have to do on the fly because i'm not going to sit here and take such absolutely copious notes that it would take you see even that concept is not found elsewhere what what he just said in luke 15:10 uh, likewise, I say unto you, there's joy in the presence of the angels um, of God over one sinner that repents. Um, I mean, there are songs that have been written based on this verse, which I can't find anywhere else. I can find shadows of ideas maybe that seem to echo something similar but that's the best I've got as far as trying to find it somewhere else now we go from this uh, right to Luke 15 11 to 32 this is the prodigal son this parable along with a few more parables that we're going to see from this point forward have been some of the most influential uh, I could call them parables or let's just say ideas from the New Testament from the four Gospels that are accepted as <laughs> what inspired I, I guess which is a problem because if we've got if we've got a lot of material that's literally contradicting itself that can't be inspired it cannot there's something wrong there okay I mean it, I, I probably would just keep illustrating this over and over again though there's there's larger and broader illustrations to be had but just as an illustration look what did he do did he give a sermon from the mount or did he give a sermon from the plain that is a clear logical contradiction and if God is not the God of confusion right isn't that when that Paul that said that right then these two contradictory ideas cannot coexist harmoniously so that's why we've got such an issue here and now Luke 15 11 through 32 we're talking about a passage that has been extraordinarily influential in the way that people have developed ideas ideas about Christianity what Christianity is what Christians are who God is what what God is like and I'm you know using the common terms God God and Christ and Christianity and Jesus and all these terms 
remarkably foreign to the terminology that you'll find commonly in the Old Testament. Um, in fact, I don't believe that Yahweh is, is called Aliyim, God, a, as often as, as he's called Yahweh, his actual uh, name, which of course that name uh, does seem to be derivative of a, a, a verb to exist. Um, however, it is still given as his title to be referred to by as in a name, not just a title. Allium would be more, uh, more of a title. However, there are there are men and factions also referred to as as Allium. Okay, so I guess it would be like um, saying the greats or or the great one. Okay. But but Yahweh is is certainly the um, the distinctive, because there aren't other men, there aren't other factions, there's nothing else referred to in that way. Yahweh, you know, um, he who who is who is self-existent, sovereign. That all of these things, you know, this this name carries with it these ideas. So just the terminology that we find in the New Testament. Um, I'm sure heavily because of, you know, the Koine Greek that's used, it is very different. It is very different on average. And um, when you understand how proactive that the, the, the writers of Scripture were um, about the language that they used, and keeping their terms consistent, um, their, 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 how fervent they were to preserve the, the language, the language that they had been using for a very long time, Obery, um, so named from Ober, a, a patriarch who was alive at the time of the dispersion at Babel, that long. So that language was in existence that long. They were fervent to keep and preserve that language, yet we see all of this in the New Testament, which a lot of people would say arguably would be the most important point, right? That's what a lot of people would argue, that it was the most important point in the Bible, that, you know, the gospel is, is extraordinarily important in, in context with the entire story. Um, because I'm not in the group with the Gideons who are okay, with making the Old Testament null and void, except for the Psalms. You know, they'll hand out those little Bibles and all they are. They're, they're the Psalms and the New Testament. So literally, what they do in printing those little Bibles is they put so much more emphasis on the ideas of Paul than all of that bulk of the Law and Prophets that we have from the Old Testament. It's really despicable. So we have the prodigal son. Now let's, you know what? It's good to just, if I read it, okay? Uh, in the King James, I will probably change the these and thous to make it a little more fluidly readable as I go, starting at Luke 15, 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me a portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And when he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. Um, and no man gave unto him. So it would appear he was hungry enough to eat uh, the husks he was giving to the swine. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. 
Make me as one of the hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. And the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring here a fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to be merry. Now this elder son was in the field, and he came in and drew near to the house, and he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants, and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and he would not go in. Therefore his father came out, and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, you are ever with me, and all that I have is yours. It was meet, or it was sufficient, that we should make merry, or it was good, I guess, that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost, and is found. Now, just a few problems I have with the ideas expressed here in Luke. Uh, so the first one, what are we talking about? Are we talking about individuals? Are we talking about people? If we're talking about individuals, then I'm not really sure what necessarily, I guess, the impact is of the reaction of this man's son who did stay with him and did keep all of his commandments. Uh, certainly it would seem to anyone, let's, I, I want to just be objective and think about this without the without us thinking about it like oh my if if i have uh, ideas that are um that that are unpleasing to god you know is he going to strike me down i don't think he doesn't want us to use our minds everything that i've seen tells me that he wants us to use our minds and he wants us to work things out based on the good minds that he's given us and not only the good minds he's given us but his spirit that he's put in us what which really helps us to figure out things that oftentimes we we struggle a lot when we try to just use our uh our carnal mind okay so let, let's just try to use that and think this out and see if we come to correct conclusions or not. So if this was um, if this was not, let's say, um, an allegory of uh, the kingdom of Israel, which had been banished centuries before, who were 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 cast to other parts of the world, um, I pose to you that, that, that this is chiefly people that were known as the Gauls, because that captivity in the Old Testament is called the Gaul or the Galut. Okay? And these are people that made their way uh, from where they were planted in the area of Madi, which we don't know where that is precisely, to be entirely honest with you, because they were put by a couple of, of certain rivers that are mentioned in this um, this land of Mahdi. Now, Mahdi is a nation that arises with a nation uh, called Paris, and Paris comes up after them, um, but becomes stronger than them. 
the thing is the the rivers that are mentioned are not ones that are mentioned in in any, any other context so we don't know for sure that that Mahdi was per se a a people that lived on the same landmass they might have lived on another so they might have been transplanted to a completely different land mass than the same landmass so if this was happening if you want to believe it was in uh that this was happening in southwest asia okay this might have been a different landmass now i happen to believe this happened in north america and for a long time i thought well uh, you know, it says that Mahdi comes from Sapun, which we know is essentially in direction northward, which if you follow the map, if you follow Gleason's map in that direction, you end up in either uh, the northern parts of Asia or the northern parts of Europe. And you can actually go right to Europe. You could go to uh, the UK and um, in France, northern Europe. Uh, Scandinavia okay that whole area is directly uh, across from North America so we don't know exactly where this land of Mahdi is M-D-Y Mahdi that was their name they're called they're they're called the Medes in the Old Testament so um, the problem is that he did come to say and it and it wasn't just the northern kingdom remember there was a lot of judah that was was taken also which quite possibly uh are represented by the goths who were also called um teuton uh with the d or or teuton um there have been waves of various migrations of gaulish and uh or celt and uh, and germanic into europe and the times in which they they came into this area and the, the things that they say happened, they are, I, I would say, they're far, um, far from being concrete and trustworthy. Okay, but we do have these people coming there from, we don't know where, and it's always the migration. Well, we're not sure. So, uh, I will tell you something interesting. If you look at Gaulish migrations, it, this is really interesting, and you look at places that were named uh, for them, usually, and, and it would really appear that, that it was, and there might be linguistic pockets in these areas as well. It doesn't start out in Turkey, in Galicia, where we think Paul was writing to. It doesn't start out there. It actually starts out more around France, UK, and the migrations go eastward. So anybody looking at that might think, well, how did they end up uh, in that part of Western and Northern Western Europe? And then a lot of their migrations were pushing eastward and southward and so on. So that doesn't seem to make sense if they came from the east and the south. You get where I'm going with that. But we'll say, fine, this is a this is an individual thing. Even though we know his ministry was um, to affect the salvation of a nation of people, we'll say it's this is individual. Fine. What's wrong with, first off, the way his brother reacts? The righteous brother, who has not only stayed with his father, he has obeyed his father. He has been a good son to his father. And his father's never given him any sort of celebration or reward. And he's put all that time in. He's put all of that heart, all of that labor into being a good faithful son to his father yet this brother of his who's a he's a dumbass he takes what he can and he goes off into some strange country and spends all of his money on on whores and partying and then when he finally comes back because he's an idiot and he blew everything his father puts what a, a great robe on him and can 
and kills a, a fine animal for a great feast with music and dancing, and he is upset. Is he, un is he upset unjustly? I don't think he's upset unjustly. But I guess before that, let's look at this. Um, it would, I guess it would have to be this. You'd have to look at this as, as an individualistic thing, wouldn't you? Even though you would think most of his parables, when he's talking about the kingdom of heaven and, um, and giving people an idea of things that were to come, uh, they have to do with a nation, a nation of people. That's what his ministry was all about. That's what his redemption was all about. That's one of the biggest problems that we have in our theology is that we turn something that was national into something that is entirely individual. And we see that as a problem uh, to this day in the churches as they have turned all of this, everything they have turned into an individual thing as opposed to the messages that we are clearly getting from Jesus himself, that he came to save his people. That's a national issue, not an individual issue. But this parable would have to be individual because you couldn't apply it nationally, could you? Well, because first off, let's say the northern kingdom, even though Assyria and other people did carry away more than just the northern kingdom. But let, we'll just say, okay, the northern kingdom, the house of Israel, as opposed to the house of Judah. Um, it would seem strange if this was uh, allegorical, comparative to them, that he said they, they asked for their inheritance and went and spent it on, on terrible living. Um, they were cast out. They were cast out of the land. They didn't go to a strange country. They were in the land that they were given, that they all of their fathers were, were given to inherit the land of Canaan. Um, the other thing is, when this one son, the, the prodigal son as he's called, um, when he spends all of his money, and it says he joined himself to this other man, and um, he was put out to feed the, the swine, and he was starving. Uh, I guess if, if you wanted to spend some time trying to argue how you could compare that uh, in a meaningful way to the house of Israel, maybe you could get there, I suppose, with enough gymnastics. I'm not seeing that there either. An issue that I have here if it's national, it says that when he came to his senses, or like in the text, it says when he came to himself, right? When he was thinking clearly, I guess. Um, <laughs> so he desires to go home. And let's, let's figure this on either a national or, or an individual level. The reason he wants to go home. He doesn't say to himself he wants to go home because he now realizes that his father's way, his father's house, his father's laws, those are good. He could have had it very good. He could have had a very good and rich and full life. If he had stayed there and continued on with his father, built his inheritance, been lawful in his father's house, how wrong he has been how wrong he has been. That way is clearly the superior way, which I would hope anybody who would come to their senses would understand that. That way is clearly the superior way. Uh, everything that Yahweh said would befall our people or us if we went against that way has befallen us. How horrified I am. His way is clearly superior. The way that the covenants that he made with our fathers, they are clearly superior. I could be greatly blessed had I stayed and had I kept them. Yet I did not. Um, 
but he's starving. And so he thinks to himself, well, even the servants, who are not the children, even the servants of my father, they eat better than I'm eating. So his decision now is based on his stomach. He's making his decision based on his stomach. It's not based on the, the objective uh, right and wrong of what it is he did not do, what he should do, the rules of his father's house, and how beneficial they would have been had he followed them. And is there a way to turn this around and go back and keep these rules, keep these laws that my father instituted and perhaps redeem myself, pick up the pieces of my life, what I can from this point forward. Is there any way to do that? Could I come to my father and tell him I was entirely wrong? Tell him I, I don't need an inheritance, but I, I understand that I was wrong and your ways and your rules, of the, the rules of your house, the laws are correct. And I have been wrong, and I have suffered greatly because I was wrong, and I now see how much I would suffer or have suffered because of doing things wrong, not abiding by your rules or your laws. But he doesn't say that. And he doesn't think that for those reasons. He thinks that because of his stomach. He's starving. His flesh hurts. So he's going back. You know, I recall that in another gospel that Yusho condemns those whose God is their stomach. Now, I'm not saying that the flesh cannot be a powerful motivator for us to do what is right and what is best. It certainly can. But he didn't say because his flesh hurt him so much that he would go back and see if he could somehow, whether as a servant, a son without an inheritance, because he's still the guy's son. Uh, and, and that's the other thing for anyone who has children. Your children are your children. There would be, there would be few circumstances that would cause somebody to say you cannot be my child anymore if you do something if you're doing something that makes me put you away cast you away if you stop doing this and if you are agreeable to do the the right things based on my rules which if you are a righteous man your rules are the laws statutes and judgments as best you can understand them of Yahweh. So if you stop doing that and you start doing this, of course, you are still my child. You're still my seed. So I'm not sure if I completely understand his way of thinking, but kind of, yes. All right, fine. So he says, if I go back, I'll, I mean, the servants eat better than I'm eating now. I can stop starving. My flesh will hurt far less than my flesh hurts now. That's his motivation for returning. My flesh hurts. And what he thinks he will get when he comes back, as opposed to going back and observing the rules which are obviously in place because they are what's best for me. He just thinks, well, I'll go back and, and, uh, and just work as a servant and I will be fed well. So even though our flesh can be a very powerful motivating factor, should that always be, should that always be the reason for us doing something different? Well, I just want my flesh to hurt less. I want my stomach to hurt less. So I'll see if I can go back here, because if I do, certainly my flesh won't hurt the way it does now. And so I wonder how, um, 
how good that message is, really. Uh, and obviously, again, I'm just going to reinforce this. We, we don't have a national message here, and we can't have a national message here. And one of the reasons that we don't and can't is because in this story, the one son who stays actually has been very obedient to his father. And as we see numerous times in the Law and the Prophets, that even after Israel was cast away into their captivity, Judah didn't behave any better, even though Judah saw Israel carried away into her captivity, saw the horrors that befell Israel. Judah didn't behave better. Judah actually behaved worse. The only reason Judah was kept around as long as Judah was kept around was because of the promise, the covenant that was made with David. that he would always have an heir on the throne of Israel. See, his heir came through the house of Judah, and his heir showed up at some point in our past, I certainly don't think 2,021 years ago. His heir came to be the heir and king over Israel and Judah perpetually just as was promised to David. Judah was kept in store, even though Judah was actually disciplined. A number of times and in a number of ways, Judah was kept in store in the land. Judah was not cast out of the land because that promise made to David had to come to pass. Once it came to pass, though, in the form of you show Jesus coming uh, performing his ministry, his, uh, his sacrificial death, his resurrection. After that, in my opinion, because of, for instance, the prophecy that we see in Daniel 9, you know, that, that's called the 70 weeks. After he'd accomplished those things, all bets were off. And it's well understood if somebody reads the, the narrative of the Bible, they get it that at that point, all bets were off, and that's why so many are so prone to believing uh, the Jewish fairy tales like Josephus. Um, the ideas of uh, the, the Roman... Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> the Roman siege. I was trying to think of the word siege. The Roman siege of Jerusalem and... Uh, and then after that, well, then there was, yeah, Masada and uh, the Bar Kokhba revolt. That's why people, that's why people are so apt and prone to believe those Jewish fairy tales is because they knew that by that point, after um, the ministry, the life, death, resurrection, th those accomplishments of you show that now all bets were off. Judah had been kept in store for that promise to come to pass. She did not behave any better than Israel. In fact, the law and the prophets keep telling us over and over again, mostly the prophets, that she behaved worse. She behaved worse. So any, the fact that anybody has to try to stretch things and make Udeos, Udeon, these forms of Yuda, just transliterated into Koine Greek into Jew, as we know the Jew today, instead of Judah, Judah, the obvious Judah, it's because they're not, they're not taking the whole context of this story um, into their minds and mulling over what was going on, who were the players, who matters in all of this? It was Judah. The men of Judah had been far, uh, had been behaving far worse than the men of Israel for quite a long time. They weren't being allowed to continue in the land that they occupied because they were being uh, obedient. It was because of the promise to David. There was a nation that was preserved and allowed to remain for a certain amount of time and after that time 
It was over. And that's what I think is important for us to consider when we look at, for instance, the Olivet Discourse in uh, Matthew. We will see what is claimed to be a parallel to that in Luke and, uh, and what we see in Revelation. Specifically in Revelation, and I think see, actually some in Matthew, but more specifically in Revelation, what will happen is a lot of the major prophets that prophesied on this, that actually Judah would be cast away from the land, and the land would sit desolate, without civilization, without Adam kind, for a very long time, before there would once again be Adam kind to uh, reoccupy the land promised to Jacob, our father, and, and his descendants, the same land, and also a great deal of the land of, of the neighboring nations, which would also be destroyed, carried into captivity, dispersed around the world, you name it. I think it's safe to say that a lot of very terrible things happened in the land after... Um, I'm sorry, I, I don't even like the word Christ. I, I don't like all of the Greek terminology that has just become, uh, you know... Lingua, lingua franca with us. I don't like it because a lot of it carries um, just assumptions in our minds. So anyways, um, yeah, after the time of you show, um, I think that there was a lot that, well, look at Revelation, uh, the four horsemen, the things that, that we saw happening which would happen right away, right? <clears throat> the first one was this rider on a horse coming to conquer, conquering and to conquer. Right, then we had uh, war and nations uh, warring uh, upon one another. We had famine. Um, and then that, that final one, well, it's... Sometimes translated as, as hell, but, but a lot of death, a lot of death. And then we see all of these um all of this language, which summons up a lot of imagery of disaster and catastrophe. So, anyways, there you have the prodigal son, and the prodigal son. has been so influential in modern Christianity. I guess what I think here when I read the prodigal son, now the interesting thing too is, uh, is in Luke 15, Luke 15 actually would appear to follow, oh, which is weird because uh, so far I haven't seen many of the passages of Luke that actually do follow <laughs> a consistent train of thought, but Luke 15 actually seems to. Because in the early verses of Luke 15, he's talking about the lost sheep. And then there's a few verses about the lost coin, right? And then we go right to the parable of the prodigal son. And that all follows a logical train of thought, right? One story to the other. You have different ways of looking at the same thing. I would have to say that looking at the prodigal son, anybody who understands the, uh, the value of the national message that you show preached, that he taught, his salvation, national salvation message. I really don't think you can apply the prodigal son to that. I, I don't. But maybe you can. And I don't want to spend the prodigious amount of time looking at specifically the prodigal son. Because, first off, the, the next parable to come which if, if it is following 
because it, he's supposed to be the same context. They haven't changed the context. So when you turn the page and you go to Luke 16, you're supposed to be in the same context. I spent a long, long time, years back, looking at uh, Luke 16, 1 through 13, because for some reason, let's just say, without drawing any conclusions, for some reason, years ago, the parables of Luke, I, I noticed that these parables were oftentimes used to argue for various ideas that I was a little unsure of or uncomfortable with or maybe didn't understand. So I started taking a look at these passages where we're at. So from Luke 15, 16, uh, 17, that whole area in, in the heart of Luke, I started looking at that because I wanted to understand these passages, why they were saying what they were saying. So without spending uh, any more time on the prodigal son, there is Luke 16, 1 through 13, and now it's typically entitled the parable of the dishonest manager. Now this one gets really super bizarre. Super bizarre. Now the first thing that's a little strange about it is that we don't have, so if you uh, if you just read the King James, let's say, the King James and a few other translations, they have all the words that are attributed to you show Jesus in red. And everything else is in black. Now that actually makes things kind of easy when you go through the Gospels because what you can do is anywhere where you're at, you can see, okay, this is dialogue coming from the mouth of Jesus. And everything in black, that is um, what is being written as far as the narrative by the author. Okay. So in Luke 15, we only have a few little scanty passages that are actually the author. The rest of it is dialogue, okay? So in Luke 15, 1, it says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes, scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. That's the, that's the charge and the cause for everything that he is saying after this, okay, in the context of, of Luke. And we don't have any change, okay? We have him saying everything he's saying because it says the Pharisees and scribes murmured against him, saying that this man receives sinners and eats with them. Now we have no change in context, scenery, or anything else concerning those three uh, parables that he tells in Luke 15, all kind of revolving around the same subject matter. It's all a logical flow of information. And then in Luke 16, 1, it says, Then he said unto his uh, disciples. Okay, so apparently those, those first parables that he's giving in Luke 15 were meant for the Pharisees. And then when we get to Luke 16, 1, um, he specifically, as according to the author, specifically pointing this towards his disciples. Now, this parable found in Luke 16, verse 1 through 13, and I'm not, we'll, we'll get to what follows it. This parable, not only will you not find this parable in any other gospel or anywhere else, you you won't even find this idea expressed in, say, another form anywhere else. Um, not just that. You will find verses incorporated into this lone, stark parable told in Luke. You will find verses that are used to accentuate or emphasize this particular parable, you will find them in radically different concepts and contexts in other Gospels. 
So, okay, this is the parable of the dishonest manager. Totally bizarre. And I'll read it because it has to be read. Luke 16, 1 through... And he said unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he wasted his goods. And he called him, and he said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of your stewardship, for you may no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, What will I do? For my Lord takes away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig, I, um, I cannot dig to beg, I am ashamed. So he's saying, I can't, I can't do manual labor. Uh, <laughs> either too lazy or too weak, I suppose, since he's a steward. I cannot dig, and he says, I'm too ashamed. I'm, I'm, what he's saying is, I'm too proud to beg. So he won't do manual labor, and he's too proud to beg. So in four, I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and he said to the first, How much do you owe my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then said he to another, How much do you owe? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take your bill, and write fourscore. And the Lord... Now, this is first off, before we get to this next thing. What he's doing... Just think about this. What he's doing, not only did his Lord find him to be a steward who essentially was stealing. He was squandering what was the Lord's. Goods, wealth were not his. He was embezzling from his master. He was embezzling. And not only was that the charge, and it wasn't just one embezzlement, obviously this was a pattern of embezzling that he was guilty of and being dismissed for. So not only is there that, but thinking of himself, he decides, well, I don't want to work for a living, and I'm too proud to beg. What I'll do, I'm going to go to all these men who owe my lord, who I've been embezzling from all this time. And I'm going to strike some sweet deals with them. I'm going to strike some sweet deals with them. And what he's doing is, he's just, he figures he's going to move down the ladder, but he doesn't want to move so far down the ladder that he has to actually do manual labor, good honest work. And of course, he's too proud to beg. Now, one thing that is never clarified in this parable is whether or not the Lord was a righteous man. Like, for instance, he could just simply be a man. Just because he's called the Lord does not mean he came into his wealth dishonestly or by any other means. He could be a man who worked quite hard, was very blessed, and had a great abundance. And he made loan to people because he had a great abundance. Now, if you have a great abundance, you don't need employees specifically because you're loaning on usury or taking advantage of anybody. It could simply be because you have so much and you are selling a lot, you are doing a lot of business and commerce, and you need someone to manage all of that. So what is owed back to him? For one thing, it doesn't say it's it's owed back to him um through usury, through uh, interest, or, or that kind of unrighteous or unlawful debt. It's simply, these people owe him these, these debts. They, they owe him a certain amount that he has given to them, probably on credit, so they may have been likely in another industry. And they had gotten from this man 
on credit and owed him these things. So what this steward does is he figures I'm not going to be as comfortable or well paid with this guy, so I'll ingratiate myself with these others and perhaps then I can get uh, some sort of position or be taken care of in one way or another from these men who appear to be men as a uh, men of substance as well and that's why he's appealing to them that's why he's doing them these favors because if these were just poor common folks he would not care about doing them favors this is obviously a uh, a soft um degenerate minded guy and this is the way he's thinking so even though he is um guilty of embezzlement now he's going to go out and he's going to steal from his lord by changing the contracts that are currently in effect with those who owe him as to ingratiate himself with them so then the next verse luke 16 8 and the lord now listen to this it says, right after he had had these guys change their contracts, thus stealing a great deal more from his Lord. Then as per Luke 16, 8, he says that Jesus said, And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourself friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. What exactly, what message exactly are we getting from this? Because in other Gospels, in other things that you show teaches, he teaches concepts that are radically different than this. Light does not have fellowship with darkness. He doesn't teach those who are the children of light, those who are the children of the kingdom, whatever you want to call them. He does not teach them to emulate the people of the world. He doesn't do it. But here all of a sudden we're taking this great lesson from those in the world and he says the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light so we're supposed to look at the unrighteous steward <clears throat> as wiser and somehow i guess we're supposed to apply i don't know how we're supposed to apply the one to the other, if you're the, the children of light, if you're righteous, I'm not sure how to apply the acts of this unrighteous steward to anything, to be completely honest with you. And then further on, when he says, make to yourself friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Now, I don't see any of the prophets or any righteous men, godly men, throughout the law and the prophets, doing this. This seems entirely counterintuitive to everything that I have experienced from the rest of the scripture, the law and the prophets, what I'm seeing here, and from the rest or... Yeah, I mean, just the rest of, of everything else that we can find him teaching. Now, what's really weird is then he uh, 
according to Luke, then after this, he, he throws in some dialogue, which we can find peppered into other places, like uh, Luke 16.10. It says that he's continuing. This is all just one, I guess, one speech, all part of this uh, parable of the unrighteous steward, L Luke 16.10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust in much. Um, <laughs> and how do we compare this? I mean, if we look at TSK cross-reference, one place it compares it is to Matthew 25, which is night and day different in its concept to this. Because that is Matthew 25, 21. That's the good steward. The good steward. His Lord says to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. It's radically different than what we see here. Okay. Um, and I don't think we're going to actually find... The next one is kind of just a, a echo, 1611, of what we saw in 1610. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you tr uh, trust the true, and then it says riches. Now, he, the context that he was speaking to his disciples, and I'm not really too sure why he would be encouraging his disciples um, in being faithful in unrighteous mammon to see that even that steward wasn't faithful in unrighteous mammon. I mean, he everything he did was entirely about himself. He was saving his own skin, everything he did. He was not only dishonest and a thief, he was unlawful. He was a thief. Um, in order to save his skin, he was further thieving. Okay? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? I don't know. I mean, I guess you could ap apply that um, sort of thinking. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we kind of could, you know, if we look at that parable from Matthew 25, I guess we could say, yeah, you know, um, if you can't uh, do well with a little bit that somebody has lent to you or to take care of, then who's going to give you any of your own riches? I mean, yeah, that concept in and of itself is sound. But as far as where do we find it or in what contexts? We find it in context, for instance, Matthew 25, 14 through 29, which is completely different. It is entirely different. This, this is actually about a man who travels into a far country and he leaves uh, stewards with a, a certain amount of wealth to, uh, to manage while he's away. And then there are consequences depending on how they manage it. Completely different concept. Entirely different concept. Um, as a matter of fact, the one steward that he has that doesn't do anything with his money, forget stealing it like this steward was a thief. This one, this one was a thief. In Matthew 25, 14 through 29, just the steward who didn't do anything with it, just buried it. He is um, regarded as extremely wicked as a servant. So there's this huge contrast between even a parable from Matthew that you can kind of sort of say would be parallel, okay? And then the last verse in all of this is Luke 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, and you know where that's going to come up, right? It's going to come up in the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, Sermon on the Mount. It, it is Matthew 6.24. And of course, it, it is in a, an entirely different context that we find that verse. So it's almost exactly word for word the same verse, by the way. Yeah, um, it's right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. 
And it's in a passage where he's talking about laying up treasures for yourself in heaven. Right? He says, lay, lay not up treasures for yourself on earth where moth does rust and corrupts and, and where thieves break through and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Now I would say positively that that steward was full of darkness. But, but for some reason he's telling his disciples to emulate this behavior or this sort of idea, and I can't for the life of me understand why. What possibly about what he did? You would ever <laughs> encourage somebody to do. And then here, after the laying up for yourself treasure in heaven, if your eye is e evil, Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. He's talking about being double-minded. <laughs> Wait a minute. Is the lesson that we're supposed to take from this evil steward is, well, at least he wasn't double-minded. <laughs> he was a thief at the start, and he was a thief at the end. He was very consistent. He stayed the course. <laughs> you can learn something from him. What is with you people? You're always wishy-washy being tossed by this wave and that wave and the other look at this man right here he was a thief at the beginning and when he found out he was going to be fired because he was such a thieving crappy steward he didn't he didn't go and dig ditches he didn't beg he used his brain and he made sure he would be able to continue to be a thief all his days Take a lesson. What is the matter with you people? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, hey, you can say whatever you want to about me. That's fine. That's completely fine, but uh, I just don't get it. Now, I don't think there's going to be any point to getting into the next Whopper, even though it's in the same chapter. I'll have to just pick it up. But it is a little strange. Um, <laughs> I do have to bring this up. It's just the last few verses that follow the parable of the crappy steward who we should definitely emulate. It says in Luke 16, 14, the Pharisees also who were covetous, they overheard him because he wasn't speaking to them, right? He was speaking to his disciples. They being covetous, they heard these things and they derided him and said unto him, you are they which justify... Oh, I'm sorry, I said him. <laughs> I thought it was the Pharisees. No, they were... Okay, they derided him. And he said to them, to the Pharisees now, you are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And again, now I'm sorry, my mind just stopped because now I'm thinking back to the steward. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find anything in here which might be some kind of a signal to me, telling me, oh, this is what you missed about it. There's something so profound in here, and here's how you missed it, you dummy. But I'm not. So I just had to think about that for a second to think, is it something in there? And then it says in 1616, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. Now, where have I seen that? Hold on. Matthew 11. We have jumped to Matthew 11. And now remember the, the next verse. He says, 
it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one tittle for the law to fail. That's actually from Matthew 5. <laughs> I'm sorry. It, he jumps around. So yeah, 518. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Totally different context. Okay. This is supposed to be from Matthew 11, 9 through 14, what he just said about the law and the prophets were until John. It's, and people have used this one a lot in various, when they want to prove various different dogmas of theirs, right? So when we see it, we see it in Matthew 11, starting in 13, all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Totally different context, by the way, because you remember this was where um, the messengers from John the Baptist were sent to him. That makes a lot of sense, actually. The message that he tells them and, and everybody standing around, right? Because in Matthew 13, he says, the, the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you will receive it, this is Elias. He's talking about John, which was to come. That was supposed to be the one announcing the way preparing the way for him. Totally different context, right? And then there's the passage that we can find in the Sermon on the Mount, or the plain. And the weirdest part about this, and I'll wrap with this because the next verse is the rich man and Lazarus, which is really major unpacking needs doing in there. Um, Luke 16, 18, whoever putteth away his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her that is put away from her husband commits adultery. Well, what can I say? Sort of. <laughs> yeah, sort of. Because what that verse is referring to, that those are maxims, maxims of the law. They have to do with whether or not a wife is is true and faithful to her husband or not, and various provisions of the law, depending on her behavior, that were made. These were, this wasn't just for no reason, and all of these weren't having to do with just the hardness of someone's heart. Um, there was more to it than that. But as no one's seeing a kind of a weird progression, uh, forget the fact that uh, the first verse we see, you're going to find um, in Matthew 11, and the next one you're going to see is in Matthew 5. And this one right here, again, you're, gonna, you're going to go and you can find it in Matthew 5 in a completely different part of Matthew 5, but also more distinctly Matthew 19 and 9. Because I remember reading this, and I've read Luke 16 many times in the past, trying to sort of recon reconcile it, and um, I remember wondering why on earth Is he going from this one idea to the other like this? Like, just swinging so hard from one thing to the other. And never never being able to come up with a good answer. And um, none of it ever making sense. Why? And there were other portions of Luke that uh, in the past... That same thing has been the case. I just never understood. Why? Why are these things so strange? Why is he going from one subject to the other so radically? And, and why do these things seem so strange in the context as presented? And um, I would say from the last seven videos and, and this one that I think I know why. And with that, see you next time.